Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Ricardo Caballero. Ricardo is a professor of economics at MIT and has published widely in the field of macroeconomics and international economics. Ricardo joins us today to talk about the safe asset conundrum and why we should care about it. Ricardo, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me on your program. Oh, it's a real treat to have you on. I've followed your work, I've cited your work, and we've talked about your work previously on the show. So it's great to have you on here to join the conversation. With all my guests, I always begin with the question, how did you get into economics and eventually into macroeconomics? Oof, a trip into memory lane, I guess. Uh, well, I mean, back in the 70s in Chile, you know, I'm a Chilean, uh, if you were a good student, you could either go to law school, to med school, or become an engineer. But, uh, but the 70s were also the times where the Chicago boys were a big thing in, in, in Chile. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and so they created a fourth option for math-oriented people, which was called commercial engineering. And that was a split into sort of a business track or an econ track. And uh, I went in for the business track, uh, but very quickly became addicted to sort of the economics logic, and I shifted uh, tracks, and, uh, and that was the beginning. Then I, when I finished my undergrad, actually, I tried to stay in, in, in go back to the financial sector, uh, but then we got into the financial crisis in uh, in Latin America, and, and then my opportunity cost went down, so I decided to migrate <laughs> to the U.S., and the rest is history. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the safe asset shortage problem. And you're one of the original authors. You're the founders of this literature. Is that right? I mean, did, did you you got this conversation going before Bernanke got his savings conversation going? Is that right? Well, I I, I was given talks, informal talks about it. Okay. My, my mold came came after that. But but at the level of informal talks, yes, I was talking about this. I did not call it to be fair the safe as a shortage initially. I call it. Uh, an asset shortage initially. Okay. So, so I was seeing bubbles and all these things as, as, a, as a result of of that 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 problem, and and then it migrated into safe asset shortages. But initially, it was an asset shortage more more generally. Okay, so but it's safe to say, fair to say that you were kind of the the original one thinking about this issue, which now has gone mainstream. Lots of people are talking about it, and we see it in an amazing way manifested around the world. Um, so it's it's great to have your perspective because you've been here the whole time, right? You've seen you've seen this from from, from the beginning to the end. So you, you've you've been um, you know very uh, capable in recognizing this issue long before others did. Let's begin our conversation on this by first defining what is a safe asset. Well, that's a that's a fascinating question in itself. I think it uh, because it's, there is no fixed definition for that. No. It's a concept that is very elusive because it depends on, it changes over time, it, it depends on the economic environment. I mean, what we need in the form of safety depends on whether you're in a high inflation environment, in a low inflation environment, in, an in, in a crisis prone environment or not. So it changes and it depends on, 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 on what other people think uh, is an asset, they say whether an, an, other people think it's some asset is safe or not. So it depends on conventions and on many, many things. Who knows? I mean, even Bitcoin may become a, a, a safe asset in, in the future. But but I think that in current times, uh, the preferred flavor seems to be an asset uh, whose value sort of is resilient to, to uh, deep systemic crises, especially financial crises. So U.S. Treasuries, German bonds uh, uh, seem to be particularly safe uh, from that perspective. Yes. So we're going to draw from your... Journal of Economics Perspectives article you've co-authored in the summer 2017 issue titled The Safe Asset Shortage Conundrum. And you use a very similar definition there. You say it's a, for the sake of the paper, and we use it for our conversation today, a dead instrument expected to preserve its value during adverse systemic events. So something like the 2008-2009 crisis. Is that right? Yes, indeed. Okay. Uh, exactly. Or the European crisis. and Okay. Kind. Now, uh, you mentioned uh, treasuries, uh, German government bonds. Would would cash be considered a safe asset too? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Now, so that, those are all the public 
sector provided safe assets, and they're the ones that seem to be more resilient relative to the other option, and that's privately provided safe assets. And in your paper, you go on to call, call many of them pseudo safe assets. So speak to us about that. What would be an example of a private sector provided safe asset? Well, uh, bank deposits or, or, or uh, certainly all the upper tranches of, of the CDOs that were created before the okay. subprime crisis. And uh, I think that, that what we learn again in this crisis is in the previous crisis is that, that uh, the, the private sector is fantastic at producing microeconomic safe assets, but not macroeconomic safe assets. So, so you can produce things that, that, you know, if there's no systemic risk, they can be very safe. I mean, you have a, you know, a, a triple A corporate bond probably is, uh, is, uh, is very safe to assume that there will be no default. So absent any major event, it will be very safe. But in a systemic event, it changes. <laughs> so, so I think that that's the major lesson uh, uh, of, of this crisis is that, that ultimately in a very large systemic event, the private sector is simply not designed uh, to produce safety. Yeah. So one of the things you often heard going into the crisis with some of these AAA rated mortgage backed securities that they had, they'd done a great job eliminating idiosyncratic risk, right? You, you package them in such Absolutely. a way that if one, one household loses its job, bad health, and it, you know, can't pay its mortgage, you're not going to be hammered. But what it failed to recognize, and understandably so since there had, it's been a long time since we had something as severe as the Great Recession, but it didn't account for systemic or nationwide Crisis, and so that's that's this distinction you're making that private sector provided safe assets aren't as durable or resilient as, as ones provided by the public sector. To 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 that kind of events, I mean, also we have to be careful huh? because remember that Italian debt and Greek debt was also once considered a, a safe safe asset, and yeah, and, and they lost the status during the European crisis. So, so it it is true that that governments seem to be governments that have deep pockets. Uh, are able to produce them better than the private sector, but but there are some sovereigns out there that do not. And in fact, I think that the, the, this shortage of safe assets really began. We're going to talk about this probably later, but it began from emerging markets, and 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 they they also produce uh, local assets, but they were not deemed to be safe on, in in the sense that we're describing here. Okay. So kind of speaking to your point about Italy, I mean, in the limit, nothing is perfectly safe then. Even U.S. treasuries at some point could become risky assets, right? Absolutely right. Absolutely okay. right. And uh, that, I mean, that's, as I said earlier on, and this depends on what uh, you and I believe and what I believe right. that you believe and things of that kind. <laughs> right, right. Okay. So, so you're right. But at any point in time, there's sort of a hierarchy, there's a ranking. And, and at this point, the ranking seems more or less clear sort of at the top. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense too, right? At, at the end of the day, General Electric might go might go bankrupt, but the U.S. government still has the printing press. It still has – it can still force us to pay taxes. The U.S. government will go bankrupt after GE. It will be the last uh, institution to, to go belly up. So therefore, we have more confidence <laughs> – as a, as a creditor to lend to it. Okay, well let's let's move on then to the to the problem itself. So first, just kind of give us a summary. What is this safe asset shortage problem? Well, I mean that that's a it's, a, it's another very good question because there is, seems to be a confusion out there. It's mm -hmm. a, a shortage doesn't mean that there is a gap that there is no equilibrium and that we have uh, more demand than we have safe assets. I mean, at the end, we have an equilibrium, uh, and so everyone has wants, uh, has what it needs. Uh, but the, the, the shortage means really that the economy has to do a variety of very costly adjustments to ensure that equilibrium. So, so that's that's in the sense it's not that there is a disequilibrium, there is a gap, but that that in order to have that equilibrium, in, in order to close that shortage, the economy has to go through very unnatural routes. And, and that's what it means to have a shortage. And the specific natural routes, I think that, that so for a while, this, 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 this shortage was, the, the adjustment was very benign, I would say, you know, when the mm -hmm. interest rates were declining steadily, that, that was a benign part of an adjustment in that market. But then we fell into sort of incentive problems, which we were recently discussing in, in the financial system, and eventually we fell into sort of a, a liquidity trap type environment, a very acute form of liquidity trap type environment. So, so there is an equilibrium in the safe asset market, but that, but one that has sort of produces very bad incentives for the private sector, and at the same time, 
it, it leads into a macroeconomic problem of the kind that we're seeing today when most eco large economies around the world are very close to the effective lower bound. Yeah. So just to put some numbers on this, in, in your Journal of Economic Perspectives article, which we'll put on our website with the podcast, you have some rough estimates of the supply of safe assets. So in, in 2007, you estimated it to have been about $20 trillion. And then after the crisis, some years later in 2011, it had fallen to $12 trillion. And so the supply has fallen, and we know for a fact that you know, the demand for safe assets rose sharply during the crisis, in addition to just normal growth of the global economy. So that, that's, a, that, you know, in absolute dollar terms, that is a, a severe reduction in the supply of safe assets. Well, yes, it was very dramatic, but I, I think this is very interesting because I think that, that, that uh, the, the underlying trend, I mean, was there present before that, and we sure. could see it in rates and, and spreads and so on, but, but, but somehow there was such a large increase in the supply of, of, of safe assets, uh, pseudo-safe assets, if you will, yes. uh, that, 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 that masked the trend. And, and what the crisis did is, is put us back into what should have been the trend from the beginning, Plus the extra, uh, 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 as you mentioned, the extra demand that, of safe assets that come from, from from the specific aspects of the crisis, the uncertainty, and all that. But but from the point of view of the supply, I think just put us back uh, into something that we had essentially masked for a while through financial engineering. Yeah. So all the AAA rated mortgage backed securities, or well, not all, but many of the AAA rated mortgage backed securities. Um, or what you would call the pseudo-safe assets. We thought they were safe, and then when the push came to shove, the crisis emerged, we realized they really weren't that safe. Um, yeah, and also the postponement sorry, yeah. of, the, of European, the European impact of the, of the, of the crisis, in you know, which yep. Italy and Greece continue to issue an enormous amount of debt. That, that, that That's eventually. right. The European, you also mentioned the European countries as another example. But just, just yeah. to flesh this idea out a little bit more, in, in some of your other research, um, you've talked about you know, this idea so, – well, let's, let's step back. So there's, there's both kind of a – we'll get to the specifics in a minute, the developments, but there's both kind of a long-run trend story you tell as well as the more cyclical, you know, 2008, 2000, 2009 story. And kind of the long-term trend story you've, you've, said, you've, you've shared in your literature is that the global economy has, has taken off, and as a consequence, the demand for saving vehicles, safe saving vehicles, has also grown – but the capacity of the global economy to produce them is not kept up. Um, and, yeah. and so we look at the emerging markets. Another, another way of, of framing this I've, I think you've written about is that we've had financial globalization. So suddenly the whole world has opened up. There's a big discussion today about gross capital flows becoming more and more important. We, instead of looking at net capital flows, we want to look at gross capital flows because of financial globalization. So funds are flowing rapidly across borders, but that massive flow of funds has outstripped the financial deepening or, or the, you know, the markets to produce reliable, safe assets. And so there's been this trend that's always been there. And as you mentioned a few minutes ago, it was masked by the private sector producing these, these, these safe assets. So my question is, who is the main producer of safe assets to the world? So if we want more safe assets, who do we turn to? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, I think, without a doubt, the U.S. is the main producer of safe assets, and Europe is is, is very close behind, uh, and Japan. But Japan is is an island, <laughs> no, mm -hmm. literally, and 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 so it's, it's, it's self consumes its, uh, its its safe assets, and uh, so there is little to share with the world uh, for that. Uh, uh, but but for the world, the surplus is being given mostly by the U.S. and uh, and, and Europe. Yeah, so some of your colleagues had a paper, Goran Chosh and Ray had a, had, had a paper yes. in uh, 2007, I believe, but they talked about the U.S. as a banker to the world. I've actually wrote, wrote something that followed up on that. And I, I think it's a very powerful analogy or way of thinking about this, that the U.S. has effectively become a financial intermediary to the rest of the world. And what they highlight is if you look at the U.S. balance sheet, so if you consolidate both the public and private sector – and you look on the liability side, so you know what do we owe the rest of the world? You find that foreigners come and they 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 buy up and they want to hold our safe assets, so treasury bills, commercial paper, uh, bank accounts, bank deposits, and and it's and the liabilities to the rest of the world for the U.S. is disproportionately those type of of, of claims on us, those type of assets. Where if you look on our asset side, what do we do? We go and invest in riskier assets. So we're 
we're kind of you know funding or borrowing short term, lending long term. There's a nice spread there. But effectively, the U.S. is like this massive bank to the world. So what do you think about that argument? Oh, I, I love that paper. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's about gross flows. And, and uh, I think they got it just right. And in fact, during the crisis, we saw the flips. I mean, the French have, have always envied you know, the U.S. For, for, for being able to be the banker of the world. Mm-hmm. But, but I think in the, during the crisis, we saw the flip side of that, which is uh, that the U.S. had a massive transfer of resources to the rest of the world. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, so the, the U.S. is sort of charging an insurance premium for always selling insurance to the rest of the world all the time. Well, that times when it has to pay back, and and the crisis was that time, and, and a big part of it happened through the appreciation of the dollar. That's a very strange situation. A country that is in the middle of a crisis, and and ends up appreciating its currency. So 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 yes, the U.S. is sort of the insurer of last resort. Uh, there is no doubt of that. And again, I think Europe is uh, is now emerging as as, as the second one. So if I look at a bank, an actual bank, I'm going to really flesh this analogy out. If I look at a regular bank, they are in some sense running current account deficits with their local communities, right? They're, they're taking in more funds and they're, they're paying out. That, that's how bankers earn their, their living and their, their income, the profit of the bank, right? So sure. if, if a country is the one of the main providers of safe assets, look at the U.S., we're going to look at Europe, and it makes sense. We've got deep capital markets in the U.S. We've got relatively better rule of law, all the, all the things you'd want – uh, to provide your safe assets, shouldn't we expect the U.S. Uh, on the you know on the margin to run more current account deficits? I mean, sh- and, and and thus should we be as concerned about the current account deficits the U.S. is running? No. Well, to start, I mean, we should be running a trade deficit for sure, uh, because we have an income spread there that we can fund, no? Yep. Uh, uh, so differential. So so. So no, that's very considered. We wrote a few papers, indeed, with Pierre Olivier and Emmanuel Fari about those global imbalances and, and that being sort of a natural equilibrium. It's, it's what is supposed to happen. Now, the question is, is uh, you know, this relates to, to, to a point you raised earlier on, which is uh, you can run it, you can build enormous amount of debt, as Japan has done, for example, but not, not external debt in the case of Japan, but, but, but at some point people may decide to switch uh, you know, and in, yes. in, in terms of, uh, and, and that's the risk. Now, I, I, I don't worry about that too much for now, I must say, because uh, for people to be able to switch, they need a substitute. Exactly. And at this point, there isn't a clear substitute. <laughs> so, right. when, in fact, uh, there was a big, uh, I remember many people talking about the, the deficit of the order of 6% of US GDP, I remember before the crisis, as a, as a source of concern. Uh, by analogy with the sign stops that emerging market experience when they have very large current account deficit. And I always argue that that was not the source of fragility because, because it, there wasn't enough sort of French real estate to, as a substitute. And when you have this problem in Chile, then, then it's very easy to go to Argentina, Brazil, you know, or, 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 or Russia if you want to find a substitute asset. But in the case of the U.S., there were no natural substitutes at the time. So I didn't worry too much. And I don't worry still now. Maybe in a few years from now, or more than a few years, if China becomes sort of a, a, a great asset, safe asset producer, then, then you may have to worry about it. But I don't see it as a major source of concern now. The only mild rival is Europe, uh, but it's a mild mm-hmm. rival. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating point. Again, if you go back to the bank analogy, the U.S. is a banker to the world. If you're going to run on your bank because you don't think it's no longer safe, you, you should have an alternative bank to go to, right, and deposit your funds. And what, you, what you're saying is, well, what's the alternative, right? There is no other bank like the U.S. for the world. So for better or for worse, you know, we, we are the banker of the world, and so it's it's not likely. And the other thing is your prediction was right. I mean, you know, there, there were a lot I – mean, I recall a lot of people talking about a dollar crisis before 2008. Yeah. I mean, it was, and it was, you know, and I got caught up. I was like, oh man, yeah, this is serious. But you were right. It wasn't really, that wasn't the issue, obviously, that, that came to, to haunt us. Um, I thought I'd appreciate it, actually. Yeah. So let me ask, ask this question. If, if the U.S. is being the banker of the world, providing the safe assets to the world, what happens if the U.S. starts running budget surpluses? And this actually happened in the late 1990s, right? So, well, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that that was one of the things that put pressure on on, on interest rate, which is that the U.S. began to run current uh, budget surpluses. Yes, indeed, and and that that shrinks the supply of assets. Now it depends a lot on timing, you no? Know, because sure. if the economy is going through a very good momentum as it's currently going on, on for example, and and and. Uh, 
and uh, the risk premium starts declining and so on, then, then it doesn't very matter very much. But, but if things get a little dicey again, then, then, uh, then it will matter a lot. And that's one now, of the... Having said that, I don't think that the U.S. will run sort of a budget surpluses for a while. But uh, yeah, you want to, we want to be careful. Don't take things for granted. But but this definitely kind of relaxes the budget constraint on <laughs> on the U.S. government. I mean, it's well, for sure. You know, it's, it's it makes it a lot cheaper for, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so on the margin, it makes it easier for Congress to to spend money. They're not facing the, the pressure of higher interest rates. But someone once joked, you know, before the crisis, back in, back when people were worried about the dollar crisis, people were joking, what is the U.S.'s true comparative advantage? And the joke was issuing debt. Ha, ha, ha. But it is. I mean, I, I guess, you know, this discussion says, yes, it actually is our comparative advantage. You know, some countries have well, comparative advantage. They're very good at it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we have the institutions. We have the rule of law. We have the experience, the deep capital markets. So we are good at issuing debt. <laughs> And the world comes to us, and 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 you in your paper you talk about the Triffin dilemma. So maybe speak to that. That'd be a good time to speak to that if you can. Well, that's that's a, that's a, that's a, the Triffin dilemma was a, you know about uh, about Bretton Woods and about uh, the demand for dollars. There, there, well, that's when when France was complaining the demand for dollars, but dollars were backed by gold, and mm-hmm. obviously there was a limited supply of gold. So. So at some point, either that broke down, or 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 the world would have to go into a recession because there was not going to be enough uh, demand for uh, uh, the dollars for for the enormous demand we had there. No? And and there's an analogy with that today in that that the, the world needs certain amount of safe assets to function, and and if that expansion doesn't take place. Uh, then you need some other adjustment mechanism. For a while, that was uh, an increase in the value of those assets, which happened mostly through uh, the declining interest rates. And uh, but there is a small margin for that uh, left, and and so it has to happen, happen through some other means. Another mean could be sort of an appreciation of the currencies in which those assets are denominated, so the dollar, the euro, and currencies like that. But that causes other problems, external account problems, and things like that. So, so eventually, you know, uh, if, if not, not, not that that can happen, then it becomes a constraint on growth, and 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 uh, and it causes a recession. Yeah. So the so the Triffin dilemma, as you mentioned, was initially applied to to the dollar, but. You- I think in your paper you apply it to the U.S. debt, right? U.S. safe assets, treasuries. Yeah, yeah the world, exactly. So the world effectively wants us to produce more debt than we actually need. They want our, they want to hold dollars and and U.S. treasuries. They want to hold, and so there's this tension between, you know, we have this incentive now to create more debt, to issue more more liabilities to the world than than we actually need ourselves to to fund, and this creates this this tension. And I, I guess the tension is at some point. We could issue so many, so much debt that no longer the treasuries would be a, a safe asset. But we haven't hit that point yet. We haven't hit that point, but but if I mean, I think backward induction is is sort of the most overrated concept in economics. But 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 at some point, people may worry. You know, say, well, you know, if if China keeps growing at, at twice the rate of the U.S. and they keep demanding a constant share of their output in the form of safe assets, then this is this has to give up somehow. But we have been making that calculation in the case of Japan for many, many years, and nothing has happened yet. No, many yeah, people have true. lost their shirts betting against the Japanese debt. Yeah, Japan's really amazing story. I mean, the amount of debt that yes. they've issued and, and and the appetite is still strong. And and that's you know so, something that's it's sometimes hard to explain to people to to, to let them say, hey, you know. <laughs> There is this bigger capacities, appetite for safe assets. Well, let's go through some of the specific developments in this story. We've kind of talked about it in general terms. But I believe you begin the safe assets story with the crashing of the Japanese bubble. Is that right? Well, yes. I mean, the, the, but again, at that time, I, 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 I did not call it a safe asset shortage. Okay. I called it an asset shortage. And, and, right. and, and it was indeed uh, the collapse of the bubble in Japan. And then later on, actually, the the the, the Asian crisis that, that I think sort of these are crises that I mean, you know, in emerging markets, I, I, the truth is, I, I came from this literature from from the emerging market side initially, thinking okay. that this is this is a pretty recurrent phenomenon. Emerging markets are economies that always have shortage of assets. You know, they, <laughs> they they can be very good at producing goods, but they don't have the institutions and so on to produce good financial assets. So there is always some some sort of shortage and. And those shortages get covered temporarily by real estate bubbles and, and, and things of that kind. Uh, and then when they crash, 
you have the hole again because there's the demand for assets, but you don't have that artificial supply, and then you, you see these gaps. I think Japan is not an emerging market, but they did go through an episode of that kind, enormous saving rate, very high saving rate. They needed assets. Those were created, well, they went abroad. They bought an enormous amount of assets. I remember coming to the U.S. when they were buying Rockefeller Center and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but also they had an enormous domestic bubble. When that collapsed, that indeed destroyed wealth, but it also destroyed a big part of the supply of assets, and that, that created an imbalance. And, and Asia, and, and emerging market Asia, went through something very similar then in the, in the late 90s. And uh, unlike Latin American economies, we have gone through these things many, many times in the past, but unlike Latin American economies, sort of Asian economies decided that this was not going to happen to them again. So they, they on top of the destruction of assets, they went on to sort of increase their saving rate enormously, and especially a, 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 a safe asset saving rate. And, and that, I think, is sort of the beginning of, of this massive trend. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's what was that? Nineteen eighty nine when the bubble burst in Japan. Yeah, ninety seven. It was Asia. Ninety eight is when it spread to Russia to to the rest of yeah. the market. Yeah, so, so and to the US through LTC. And remember, but but we stopped it quickly. But yeah, so there's so there's this this story is happening over several decades. It starts in Japan when they their bubble burst, and then the emerging market crisis you mentioned also adds to that. So. Bringing us to the late 90s then, at the same time, we just talked about earlier the U.S. running budget surpluses, you know, um, bringing down its debt. And, and again, this is so counterintuitive, right? It, most people would say, hey, that's a great thing. We're beginning to retire our debt. And what they're missing is the world actually needs this debt to function, right? It actually needs, needs well, a financial I mean, system. It, yes, but and for a while it was a great thing because it just lowered the cost of capital. It, again, the, the problem is, initially it was fine. <laughs> it, well, almost fine, because we had this incentive, little incentive problem within the financial system that, mm -hmm. that led us to a crisis. But, but, but yes, it's, it's an input we need. And, and remember also that, that at the same time as, as, as deficits were sort of closing in the U.S., uh, 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 China was coming into play yes. and growing at a very fast rate with very high saving rates, uh, with a controlled capital account, but but with, with essentially with the, the, the government doing the saving, the international saving for the local agents. So they had much higher saving rates than investment rate, both of them very high, but saving rate higher than, is, and than, than investment rate. And then all this was intimidated to the rest of the world through the central bank, but the central bank was very specialized in buying safe assets. Okay? And so that, that, that really put enormous pressure on that market. Okay. Well, let me ask this question. So in the early 2000s, when the U.S. begins its Iraq war, 2003 it invades, and this blows up the budget deficit in the U.S., did, did the Iraq war help the safe asset shortage problem? <laughs> I never thought about it, but yeah, I, I guess it was a collateral benefit uh, <laughs> out of that. But, but by the way, I mean, and you mentioned this issue before, it's, it's not that that the U.S. needs to generate fiscal deficits to do this thing. I mean, that, yeah. it, it is true that the way that is all, it's always, almost always created in, by sovereigns is as a counterpart of deficits. It's not an act of financial engineering. <laughs> but, but you could imagine, you know, making it an act of financial engineering. That, I mean, you could, you could, you could uh, issue debt, safe debt, to buy assets. Mm -hmm. No, not, not, to, not to buy goods. <laughs> you could buy assets. Well, that's uh, a great idea. Uh, I yeah, actually, I was and, going to and, ask you about that. Like, you're, you're talking of a sovereign wealth fund for the United States. Is that right? For example, yeah, for example, you could do that. I think that ultimately that's, uh, that's what we have to happen. And, and you can see, I mean, I always look at Japan because they're ahead of us in all these things. They're buying equity, literally. Mm -hmm. They're doing even, you know, sort of industrial policy through equity or, or, or environmental policy through, through equity interventions. You know, they, they, buy, they, are, they buy ETFs that are green, for green ETFs. <laughs> I, I'm not advocating for that, but, but in a sense, the, you know, the, the, what a safe asset shortage means is that the private sector sort of doesn't want to absorb the risk that is being generated by, well, the private sector plus emerging markets and so on. It does not want to absorb the risk that is being generated by the productive capacity. So someone, someone has to absorb that risk, yeah. uh, uh, ultimately. And I think temporarily, it can be governments. Uh, it doesn't even have to be through debt. I mean, it could be, it could be that the private sector generates, but, 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 but uh, if the banks are going to do the same things they were doing before, they now need to buy systemic insurance and pay for it. 
in advance, in which case the liability is, 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 is of a different form. It's not, the, it's not the debt that is out there, but there is a commitment that the public sector has you know, to support the financial system if, 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 if we run into another crisis. So there are many, uh, there are many ways of improving the efficiency which, which we do this, uh, but ultimately the problem is someone has to absorb the risk. And, uh, and uh, we seem to be running out of, of options there. Well, we'll, we'll, come back, <clears throat> we'll come back to that in a little bit later, talking about the solutions. I, I want to I flesh this out a little bit more, though. So going back to the early 1990s, so when the Iraq war happens, and you, you agree that at least potentially it offset some of the safe asset shortage. So I guess an interesting counterfactual would be if the U.S. had not done the Iraq war, and there hadn't been all these added, you know, safe assets created by the U.S. government. Would the housing boom been even bigger? You know, would would, would the private financial sector had to produce even more mortgage-backed securities? Would we have seen an even bigger bubble, and as a consequence, a bigger bust? I I, I want to agree with you, but I'm, I have to be careful. I don't want people to get into wars and things like that. No, no, no. Yeah, it's very clear. We're not advocating right. war as a way to solve our problems, <laughs> but. But but but, yeah. but you're absolutely right. I think that that was a collateral uh, benefit, probably. Uh, which is a, uh, this is already a, that's an interesting concept as well. Whether you want to crowd out the public sector, uh, the, the private sector, sort of incentives to do these kind of things, and how do you do so? Okay, and I guess this is interesting to me because I I've, I mentioned this with some some folks on Twitter. I was like, you know, one of the uh, collateral fallouts from the GOP's new tax plan is a huge big budget deficit. I said, might this address some of the safe asset shortage? And they weren't too enthusiastic about the idea. There's, there, well, and your your point is there's there's more efficient ways to address it than running big deficits, fighting wars, and other other distortionary approaches. Yes, uh, um, and, and, but having said that, I think that there's still temporary solutions. I mean, unless something changes structurally, yeah. Uh, uh, even there, there's a limited capacity to do that. We can we can buy a few years. Mm-hmm. But something has to change. Now, you know, long-term forecasts are always tricky here, but, but China could become a, 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 power, a powerful supplier of these assets and so on. But as it looks now, uh, yes, we can do things that can improve things in the short term. Again, good momentum for the global economy helps a lot because if risk aversion sort of declines, that, that, that reduces the problem significantly. Uh, but but, but it, is a, it seems at this moment that, that we are in the face of a structural problem. Okay. Well, let's dig a little deeper into why does this actually all matter? So why do we care so much about the safe asset shortage problem? You, you've already kind of touched on it in different places, but let's really kind of focus in on it. Um, and you talk about it in particularly in your papers that why it really becomes a problem with the zero lower bound problem. So talk us through, again, why a shortage can affect the real economy. Yes, well, it is, it is, that's, to me, there are two big reasons why this matters. The first one we already talked about is incentives, no? I mean, yeah. it, it certainly has an, we shouldn't believe that the private sector will not try to re-engineer safe assets if, if, uh, if the problem continues, and I, and I think we will see a lot of that. Uh, but the second one is, as you correctly point out, is, uh, is the, the, I don't know if it's zero lower bound, people call it now the effective lower bound, because we have seen negative interest yeah. rates okay. in Europe and so on, but, but still, it's clear that they cannot go very, very low. So, right. so there's a sort of limit uh, down there. And, and, and the mechanics of this is, is sort of very similar to a, to a liquidity trap. The problem is that it's harder to get out of it. So what happens in a in a in a in a in a liquidity in a liquidity trap? In a liquidity trap, really, what you have is is uh, is uh, that that you know that people want to uh, save save more, and, and, and the economy cannot uh, uh, doesn't have the assets for that. And so what you need to do is to create that wealth, and that takes the economy out. And so most of the policies to to, to get us out of a, of a liquidity crisis are, are, are policies in which you try to inflate wealth somehow and, uh, and until a point in which people feel rich enough, aggregate demand rises, and, and, uh, and you get out of it. Well, in, in a safety trap, there's something very similar that, that goes on. It, but, but the difference is that it's not that people want wealth. People want a particular form of wealth. Uh, so if you don't create that, 
uh, uh, people, you know, aggregate demand is con contracts because people want to save more in, in the form of this very difficult asset, which is difficult to find, therefore it's expensive, and so on. So, 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 so the, the situation is very similar. Uh, uh, the, the, the equilibrium will happen by lowering the lowering. The, uh, uh, if you look at the at the flow side, you look at the output side, and the equilibrium will happen by depressing the demand for safe asset. How do you depress the demand for safe asset? Well, by lowering output, lowering income, lowering savings. That that's that's the bad adjustment that happens. In, in, a, in a case like this, and again, in a, in a liquidity trap, if you think about the flow side, it's very similar. The way you restore equilibrium is well, you reduce the demand for savings by of generic savings by reducing income. Now, think of what happens in a in a, in a safety trap if there is a bubble in financial assets. Well, in a liquidity trap, if there is a bubble, a, a bubble emerges, and all of a sudden people feel richer, uh, uh, they can satisfy the demand for savings. And aggregate demand goes up, that pulls output, and you get out. Think what happens in a very strict situation where that the constraint is really a shortage of safe assets. Now you get a bubble. People look at that bubble and say, well, that's not the problem I have at this moment. My problem is a shortage of safe assets. So that doesn't pull me out of the system. So many of the, of the policies that, that, that central banks have to pull an economy out of a liquidity trap are of the wealth inflating kind. Well, wealth inflation by itself, all, the, all that it does in a strictly liquidity safety trap environment is increases the risk premium, but it does not satisfy the, the, the basic need of, of safe assets and therefore doesn't pull the economy out. You will only do so when you pull out, when you increase the supply of safe assets. Now, that's a very st strong and extreme uh, characterization. What happens in reality is that everything is sort of a hybrid of a safety trap and a liquidity trap. In the middle of a big crisis, it's mostly a safety trap. As you go, pro as the recovery progresses, then then it becomes, it turns, it morphs into a liquidity trap. But I think that's the reason we have seen such a stubborn and slow recovery. Uh, by now we're doing well, but this is more than a decade after the, the, the or at almost a decade after the crisis. What has happened is that all sort of the traditional tools to take us out of a liquidity trap really had a very mild effect because it was not a matter of a shortage of wealth. Uh, of, of wealth, but it was a matter of shortage of safe wealth. Yeah, that's very interesting. You bring this out in your Journal of Economic Perspectives paper, I'm sure in your other ones as well, but that even if you can get out of the liquidity trap, you can still have a safety trap, correct? That's, that's, yes, that's I mean, the problem. Because, uh, the, the problem is that, 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 uh, that it, always, it looks like a, a liquidity trap in the sense that, that your rates don't go up. You, you, they, they remain at zero. Despite the fact that you may begin to see speculation, you may see some assets going up, real yep. estate recovering, uh, stock market going very high, but the economy is still stuck there, and, and, and the rates continue to be low. So, so you could call it a liquidity trap, but what is interesting, what differentiates it from the safety trap is that, that yes, we are in a liquidity trap, but a liquidity trap is very stubborn because the normal ways of getting out of it are not very effective. And I think that's a big reason why we see these very high valuations today uh, in the equity market in the U.S., for example, is that, I mean, that, th there was very little traction to that. Aggregate demand was very unresponsive to that, 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 that mechanism, which would have been, uh, uh, otherwise it would have been very responsive. Had it been only a liquidity trap, it would have been of that kind. But the, you kept seeing sort of the rates very, very low, and it's not because the Fed decides that. It's the market Absolutely. wants those rates very low. Valuations going very, very high. The equity risk premium remaining very, very high. In some cases, in some places of the globe, has even increased. Uh, and and uh, but aggregate demand was very sluggish. Yeah, no, this this makes a lot of sense, and this kind of re responds to the comment Larry Summers made on the podcast earlier that I shared with you. But this, I, I think, this kind of fits, you know, brings all the pieces of the puzzle together in a nice way. And I want to touch on something you mentioned a, a minute ago. It. You know, people often will blame the Federal Reserve for the low interest rates, but as you point, it's the market. It's it's this pr very nature of this problem that's driving the rates down, right? The, for the economy, the fundamentals are pulling the rates down. This appetite for safe assets is pulling the rates down, and it's getting stuck at the at the effective lower bound. And, and what I often like to tell you know people who have a hard time because they think the Fed's you know messing artificially lowering rates is I like to tell them it's, it's this is just capitalism one hundred and one econ one hundred and one right we need markets to clear and how do markets clear markets always clear by prices adjusting and this is a case where markets aren't adjusting if you want markets to work let prices do their magic but we're not we're not able to do that with the, with the zero lower bound or effective lower bound 
Um, here, here's a, a kind of a, a follow up question to that. Is I often get a critique when, when this safe asset conversation com- came up. I'd often get this critique. People would say, "What do you mean? There's a safe asset shortage." If, if, if people want more treasury bonds, why can't they just bid up the price of the bond, right? What's, what's stopping the bond market from seeing bigger and bigger valuations of, of bond prices um, for treasury securities? And my response, I want you to critique this, You're, see what you think. My response is, look, if the interest rate can't go down, then the bond price can't fully go up because those things, those two things are linked. Therefore, Bond prices on treasuries would be even higher if we didn't have this effective lower bound. Is that reasonable? Yeah, that's very reasonable. By the way, this is not something that is only happening now. Remember the Greenspan conundrum. I mean, the, yeah. this one was trying to raise interest rates, and the long rates were t- coming down. So it was a reflection of this. And 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 uh, and it, 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 it is the case that that indeed the price of safe assets is extremely high. In the front end, when there is no more space, is a perfect substitute for cash. Well, <laughs> there is a limit on how, how how much how high they can go. On the back end, it's a little different story. And and we, indeed we have seen where I mean, you know if you go to Europe, eighty percent of their assets, their long term sovereign bonds, I think, have negative rates, so they can decline. Uh, and and uh, and and that has been part of the shock absorber. And I think part of the effectiveness effectiveness of QE has been in convincing people that you know there they have a negative beta asset that that will help. So 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 yes, it, it, prices have adjusted, but they have adjusted a lot. That's part of the point. Yeah, and that it's kind of a hard story to tell, right? You're saying, look, to get a full recovery, we need bond prices to go even high, treasury prices to go even higher. People like- At some point, by the way, you can get into a different kind of mechanism, which is, look, uh, 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 you know, uh, um, some people, me, I mean, uh, at some point, if you want, if you need safe assets, but the price goes very, very high, actually, you have to increase the saving rate. Yep. Because how am I going to retire with those kind of rates? So you can get into very perverse feedbacks in which, you know, saving rate goes up, the demand come, comes down even more, and, and, and you start getting into this. In deeper into a liquidity crisis. So I, I, I think the, 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 the world is very bipolar at this moment. I mean, we're, we're going through a good time, but we're very close to, to another nasty episode because of all these forces are so close. That's very interesting. It's bipolar. <laughs> we're on a knife edge here. We could go one way or the other. Yeah, it, exactly, exactly. Yeah. We, 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 it looks good, but we have very small buffers, and and uh, and so I think in the in, I think that this is happening at the very same time in which volatility is extremely low. So if you're, uh, and I think that's part of the equilibrium as well. If if you're a risk taker or, or a reluctant risk taker, well, this is a these are perfect conditions because you have a large equity risk premium and you have almost no volatility in the market. But but I also say, well, this is what we need in equilibrium. Look, in order to to be in the current situation, when, where we finally seem to be at sort of a natural rate of output, whatever that is, a natural rate of unemployment, uh, uh, although that's debatable, but, but we're doing this with extraordinary, extraordinary risk conditions, very, very favorable. So realized volatility, you know, the equity market uh, below 5% and VIX at uh, 8 or 9 and and, and uh, very large equity risk premium. Imagine what happens if volatility goes up to 15%. I, mean, <laughs> I think that this, this, the problem would come back with an avengeance. Okay. Uh, uh, because it's, again, the market, and these central banks, they are the central banks have a lot to, have done a lot, which is they have created an environment that seems very, very friendly to risk taking because it's what we need. The, the problem, the fundamental problem is one in which the people, investors and consumers and so on do not, in firms, do not want to take risks. You need them to take more risk. And so we have the very stretched risk markets because of that. Well, let's, let's look more at these solutions. You were talking about solutions to the problem. Um, so one, one, is, one potential solution is, is to find a way to decrease the demand for these safe assets. Um, is, is that possible? Could, could you lower the appetite for, for safe assets by, I don't know, in making people less risk averse? Um, or, or well, what? What? Or is maybe that's not possible. What are your thoughts? 
No, no. I, I, well, I think that there, there's some lower, uh, low-hanging fruits out there, which is, you know, central banks are sitting on an enormous amount of safe assets. I think they could release a few of those. Okay. Especially those using QE. I think QE is a very useful tool when, 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 when the central bank buys risky assets. But if it's buying safe assets, probably it's not helping a lot at this moment. Uh, now, in the front end, it doesn't matter because the front end is the, the, the other side of it is reserved, so so yeah. it's a wash. But when you start buying sort of long-term safe assets, I I, I I don't like it as much. Then, and so that's for for developed economies. For emerging markets, we have enormous amount of uh, international reserves, and and there are more efficient mechanisms to do that. I mean, we could develop swap lines and things like that that reduce sort of all those safe assets that are stored. In, in, in at central banks' balance sheets, in, in central bank balance sheets. So that, that I think those are the, the main, the main drivers. Then the regulatory issues that have to do with the, you know uh, Basel III and other things that could also release some some okay. some demands for, for safe assets. But but I, I see all these things as uh, as temporary solutions. It can buy us a few years and so on. But they are demographic forces, and that, okay. that I see them as very strong uh, in any event. But but yes, we can we can buy time. And reduce that, but but that's that's the point. And, and again, even even an economic recovery by itself will very naturally reduce the, the the demand for safe assets. Okay, so the fundamental problem then behind the safe asset shortage problem then is there's well several I think one you just mentioned is demographics. So demographics is just the force of nature that it's not going to go away anytime soon. And and is, is the population ages they want to. Have more you know, fixed income type assets, so that's going to increase the demand, and that's just something we're going to have to contend with. The the other one that we've talked about earlier is just that the global economy has not built up its capacity to structurally or permanently produce more safe assets, and I'm guessing that's the long term solution is somehow put us out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Now, one of the one of the suggestions we mentioned. I mean, earlier, we need to align the, the the risk produced by the by, by the proactive capacity with what. People want to demand, but 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 part of the I mean there is a lot of you know there is this whole literature of, on collateral. The Soto used to talk about this in in, in Latin America that there's there's so much collateral that is being wasted. You know there's real estate, there's so on, mm-hmm. but there, there isn't a financial industry that can transform those things into financial assets that can be used for a store of value, for safe store of value. So so the, there's a lot of space there. There's a lot of Potentially tangible assets that that, that can that they can generate that that safety. So 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 that has to be a big part of it, and and hopefully will happen from those places that are growing very fast and that are, have the potential to produce a lot of assets. I mean, if you're growing very fast, that means that you also have the potential to produce a lot of assets. Now, that in itself, producing assets, financial assets, is difficult. It requires the kind of things you have mentioned earlier in the in this show, but but also. Also, uh, 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 producing safe assets just requires even more sort of institutional strength and so on. But there's an enormous amount of assets around the world that could, in principle, become uh, the, the, the backing for, for, for the safe assets uh, if we supplement them by the right financial institutions and institutions more broadly. But that has to be the long-run, long-run solution. So uh, make sure I understand this. You're saying we need to find a way to incorporate all these existing Assets that are already out there and and and, and uh, convert them, transform them into some kind of safe asset. Yes, I mean the, the securitization story. You know that that was behind the man. Yep. Uh, uh, was was a good story. It happened that the buffer was too small <laughs> for, okay. for this kind of uh, systemic uh, asset. So we can we can improve there. Uh, uh, maybe the tranche that you can you can get is not as big as as, as as we were getting there. But but there is a lot that can be tranched out and so on. But again, that requires uh, to have the financial institutions that can 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 support that, and and uh, the monitoring institutions that can support that. It's, it requires a lot of financial development, and, uh, which is ultimately the, the issue. Okay, so we have a lot of work cut out for us institutionally <laughs> moving forward. So, yeah, that's that's not uh, the most encouraging story. Let me ask another. Um, angle on the safe assets story. So, so I have monetarist root. I like thinking about money um, and the role money plays. And you know, Gary Gordon paints this picture of, of the run on the shadow banking system, and he kind of, I, I think, weaves a story about the safe asset issue in terms of money. So that you know, re, there's retail 
users of money like you and me and maybe small businesses that use money assets you'd find in like a measure M2 or M1. And then there's institutional um, money asset users, corporations, I mean governments, uh, money market funds. And they use, you know, treasury bills. They use repos as a form of money for them. So my, my question is, is this, is part of this conversation about the shortage of money, you know, a transaction assets, not just safe assets, but transaction assets? Well, I, I, I love Gary's work, and, and, and I think he has done uh, great work on this area. But I, I think of them as a little different uh, in the sense okay. that, 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 that I think that uh, there's no doubt that sort of regulatory requirements and, and even sort of uh, uh, conventions within the financial system uh, uh, are an important story behind the demand for safe assets. But, but the particular uh, uh, aspect you are describing at this moment is, I associate it more to an issue of velocity. You know? Okay. It, it, and so, so the question is there, could we find, I mean, the type of reforms, could we find a way of, of generating more velocity out of the same stock? That's and, a good and, point. Uh, and if, if velocity sort of slowed down because of regulatory, so we need to there think about regulatory changes or, or that, that allow us to so use the, the stock that is allocated to these things uh, more efficiently in the sense that we can move it around a bit more. They do uh, miracles already. I mean, you can see yes, yes. sort of uh, lots of uh, 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 the velocity is pretty high within the financial system. Uh, but, but that's more about velocity than about the stock, I would say. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's true. They're related, of course. I mean, there's, there is, because there are risks associated to very high velocity. Uh, uh, but 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 there is an there is an extra margin of adjustment of potential solution there, which which has to do with this velocity. Yeah. Okay. That, that's that's a good perspective on that. Let's see. In the time I have left, I want to I want to go back to a, a point we made earlier about a country that's acting as a banker to the world. They're going to run current account deficits. My question is: Can a, a can a can a country? perpetually run a current account deficit? I mean, if there are no other bankers to the world, how long could the current account deficit running go on? Well, I mean, the issue is always you know, the current account deficit. By the way, we, we, we could do a, a banker in the sense that you described before and have no current account deficit in the sense that, that, that you know, you could be, you could be uh, buying the same amount of uh, risky asset abroad than you're selling That's safe true. Assets, you know? so, That's so, true. So you, 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 you can also, there's a lot of space there in gross flows. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. That don't require a net, a net flow. Uh, but the, the, the issue of the current account deficit is, is one of relative to your own GDP, you know, and, 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 okay. and, um, and uh, so that's, that's a constraint, a constraint because, because the, the producers of these assets are, are, are growing at a lesser pace than, than the demanders, the net demanders of these assets. And, and, and so that's the tension, because you can imagine a current account deficit over GDP that is growing, that, that is more or less stable, that would mean that, you know, maybe it's 10% of GDP, but, but it cannot, eventually can only grow at the rate of growth of, of GDP. And you can have an infinitely leave 10% uh, 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 of GDP type type current account uh, forever. There's no problem. The problem is if China is going at twice the pace and they keep demanding these assets, then 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 uh, then they are asking you to really increase your current account deficit beyond that. And the truth is that at the global level, that is sustainable in the sense that what puts a limit is the current account deficit of the U.S. relative to the growth of <laughs> of China, not of the, of the U.S. No, uh, but. Uh, that would require that the current account deficit of the U.S. sort of balloons, and at some point, somebody may change their mind. No, uh, uh, so so it's uh, it's a risk. We don't know where that point is because we don't have uh, any 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 parallel to this that we can see. Uh, we had some of that actually in the transition from the U.K. to 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 the U.S., but you don't see an, a, an equivalent transition happening today towards China, perhaps, mm -hmm. but. You could see, a, a, I would not be surprised of seeing another sort of round of global imbalances happening and, and, um, and, and, and to be sustainable. Um, what is the, the level? What is the limit? I don't know. I mean, from the point of view of, if you think of money as, as, as uh, of this as a problem of money and you think of money as a bubble, as a convention, then we know from the theory of bubbles that 
you can do it as long as it uh, as, as doesn't grow faster than the rate of growth of the economy. <laughs> yeah. And the rate of growth of the economy, if it is pinned down by China, then it can be, it's going to be higher than the U.S. So that would mean that, that, uh, that the U.S. Is, um, can face an increasing current account deficit. But before the U.S., actually, we should start closing the European current account surplus and so on. So, so this is space. <laughs> you know, one of the interesting countries that, that has been running a current account deficit for a long time is Australia. And it has been yep. running for decade after decade after decade. So it, it, it must be offering some kind of service to the world as well um, that, that allows it to go on. And it, or its capacity is, is larger than maybe we yeah, might but, think. Yeah, but, but remember, one of the good things of Australia is that they grow very fast. So, so, the, so the current account deficit ah, okay. over GDP hasn't blown up. It is true they have never run a surplus, but that doesn't matter. Right. Uh, it's as long as, it does, as, as they, they can keep growth. So, so there are always the issues with growth. And, and Australia is a bad example. I think they haven't had a recession in the last 20 years. Yeah, they're amazing. Yeah, so, and they are always complaining about the value of the real estate. And that's, you know, again, people are richer, they need to save. And also, that's a great the, point. Sydney is such a beautiful city. That, <laughs> but, but they have the big problem there. Exactly, it's Chinese well, going to Sydney to buy mm-hmm. a, 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 a property as a store of value. Yeah, it's a fast. Australia is a fascinating place. They did, they didn't experience the Great Recession. You know, they they've gone through. They had many of the same problems the U.S. had. They had, you know, like you mentioned, high real estate prices, a lot of household debt. They had the you know the weak, the uh, highly leveraged balance sheets, but they didn't experience the Great yes. Recession. Okay, I, I think we we need to end in a few minutes here, but I want to end on the sovereign wealth fund. I'm going to go back to that. I mentioned it earlier. So you talked about potentially the U.S. government running a sovereign wealth fund. Um, tell us again a little bit more about how that would work, and then talk about potential drawbacks to using it. Well, I, I no, you, you, you proposed the U.S. to run a so I'm, okay. I was talking about the, the, the concept, meaning meaning All that right. the, the type of interventions you need, certainly in the crisis, is one in which uh, the government broadly defined needs to buy risky assets, remove risk from the system, okay. and, and and supply safe assets, and 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 that. You could describe it as a as, as, a, as, a, as a sovereign wealth fund, but I, I I'm not advocating one 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 for the okay. U.S. So in, during crisis, that's what would happen. In fact, I always defended, for example, the Hong Kong stock market intervention in 1997. We'll talk about the crisis. They had a massive intervention in the equity market, which was incredibly successful, by the way. But that's a, those are the kind of things that you may need to think about. In an environment of this kind, so it'd be, in other words, a sovereign wealth fund would be more of a temporary feature. It wouldn't be like a it wouldn't be like Norway has its its you know sovereign wealth fund because it has oil. So for the U.S., exactly. I think for the U.S., that's that's the nature of the thing. But but the the, the bottom line is that someone needs to take more risk. <laughs> yeah. And, and 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 the question is whether you want you want this to be sort of. Uh, Workers through the government—that would be sort of the, the the kind of things you're talking about, or 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 someone else. But but uh, by the way, I think this is permeating even the labor market. I mean, I think that if you look at the labor share, part of it also has to do with this. Somehow we have to migrate to a society where risk is is spread more broadly. Now it's, maybe it's more efficient that the government does it. I don't know. Yeah. Very fascinating. Well, our time is up, and our guest today has been Ricardo Caballero. Ricardo, thank you for coming on the show. It has been a pleasure, David. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.